Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another Friday and yet another episode of the MotorOne.com Test Car Happy Hour. I am Seth Mirisma, your host for the evening um, for the next, you know, 30, 35 minutes or so. Joining me today are senior editors, plural, Brett T. Evans and Jeff Perez. Gentlemen, how are you today? Doing good. Living the dream. Yeah. Brett's, Brett's got that look of extreme focus on his face right now that indicates that he is trying to just bust his ass on all the hottest of content. Uh, He's a busy boy. Right Either that or I woke up at 4 a.m. today and I'm just desperately clinging <laughs> to, to uh, consciousness. So so your happy hour today should involve imbibing uh, cold brew and not, not rosé, maybe. Uh, I think either way I will have like a chemical <laughs> reaction in my body that's incompatible with life. So I'm just sticking to water today. <laughs> sounds good sounds good um thanks everybody for joining us i like to see uh, those eyeballs filtering in hello to gary clark uh being, and, and thank you for being the first to comment yet again um I, I hope you all take gary's lead and wherever you're watching this whether you're on youtube uh twitter or facebook please do leave us a comment or ask us a question as we hit on the cars that we've driven recently um we would love to answer your your deepest queries um with our most confused looks and furious googling um, yeah. So, uh, so why don't we just start with? I guess Gary. Gary says in transparency, I'm going to confess that Porsche's th Porsche's three pound scheme. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. That pound is it a hashtag? Um, loses me, especially when they are grouped like the the 911, 992. Corvette is attempting with the Z06, Z07 lingo, but I'm uh, reliving that, so I get it. Um, I don't know if I know the heart of that. <laughs> it's the he's. It, it's like the um, nine nine six, nine nine seven, nine nine one, nine nine ah, two. Like I three see. numbers yes. all yeah. strung together. GT three, gotcha. GT three are gotcha. like just alphanumeric soup. Yeah, alphanumeric. Yes, absolutely, Gary. You're not wrong. You need to be a diehard Porsche enthusiast um, or a collector uh, in some in some way, shape, or form. In many cases, or somebody who works for the brand to understand what all the what all the different like three and six digit codes mean um the car that we're going to talk about today why don't we just jump right into it we put it on the lead it's a car that i got to drive a couple of weeks ago out in um thermal california is the is the brand new the 2023 gt3 rs so to, to answer gary's sort of inherent question here the porsche makes a 911 gt3 that is a um higher performance more race ready version of the 911 carrera right the GT3 RS takes all of that idea and makes it almost, I mean, it is a street legal car, but it is very, very close to being a dedicated race car, as you can see by the super uh, aggressive aerodynamics package that we had there and that we'll talk a little bit about. So um, there's also historically always been a GT2 RS, which is sort of the pinnacle um, of the of the line and, and the raciest and fastest one. But the... Um, as, as I experienced, the GT3 RS does just fine <laughs> in, in that regard. So, um, yeah, this is a this was a fascinating car, a really, really fun car to drive. I'll, I'll say that I did not drive it on the road at all. This was a purely track focused program that Porsche put together um, at the Thermal Club track, um, which is appropriate for the car. So um, I guess, guys, I'll just start by highlighting a little bit of what's been done to the car to make it different from the standard GT3, which is already quite capable. Um, the, the primary thing is that that big wing that you're looking at right now that we see arrow. I mean, that, that is a really important part of it, right? So um, there's there's a super aggressive arrow package, including this all carbon, carbon fiber active wing um, that creates a, a maximum total of it's nearly 1900 it's it's 1890 and some pounds of downforce um at at maximum speed which um in effect just means that when you're when you're at kind of in especially a long sweeping corner when you're at maximum attack you're getting you're getting all of this uh air pressure essentially pushing the car and the tires onto the ground giving you tremendous grip in in uh quartering situations under load conditions that you wouldn't have uh, with the car with the same kind of tire setup and way less arrow, right? This is why race cars go fast because they can go around corners really, really quickly. Um, so that really is the is is the magic uh, or part of the magic for this car it, that that the, they've done arrow so well. And and one thing that gets a lot of, um, uh, you know, as it gets talked about a lot in the in the technical sort of data for this car is that they've also moved to support that. This car only has one radiator as opposed to three in, in most 911s and in the GT3, right? So 
they've removed, uh, they've gone to a centrally mounted radiator um, and, and removed the side radiators to try and maximize the amount of cooling, but also so that they can achieve the aero effects on the side of the car that they need to achieve, right? So they've gotten really clever about how they're getting air into, um, into and out of and around the vehicle. Um, to really give you maximum downforce. Um, so so that's that's a huge part of the RS package, the GT3R um, RS package. Uh, <clears throat> Gary, to answer your question, yeah, no back seats. They, they pulled the back seats out of this one. There is a full roll cage in the car. Um, it's a track car, right? It's it's set up to drive on the track. Um, I know you didn't drive and... it. I know you didn't drive it on the road at all, but how awful is it do you think it would be on the road as, as far as like how harsh the suspension is and how just tight everything is i don't think it would be awful at all to be honest like in fact we were talking to a lot of the guys so the other the other really cool thing that porsche has done with this car is a super advanced version of, of a way to essentially tune and tweak the suspension um and then things like the differential um so that it drives very differently under different conditions right you've got so you've got the steering wheel you've got four buttons with dials on them under on the bottom part of the steering wheel which is not unfamiliar from um i think a standard 911 just has one of these to do to change the drive mode settings yeah. um you've got you've got four here the cool thing is and it's sort of hard to describe it's easy to do but when you enact like for instance i'm going to change the drive modes or i'm going to adjust the differential all four, all four of those dials can do different things. And what they're doing is mirrored up on the screen, as you can see here, right? So it creates this little animation so that you can tell without really having to put your eyes down here, what you're changing. Um, and the thought there is, if you're really racing as the track conditions are changing, if your tires are, are starting to get worn, you may want to adjust some of these settings um, so that the car drives differently um, as you need it to. So Jeff, that's a really long way to answer your question. I think because you can you can tune everything to be so soft if you needed to. I actually mm -hmm. think that you can use this to make the car pretty compliant on the road. And some of the guys from Porsche were indicating that was the case too. It was actually kind of neat because it could be in theory a car that you, you know, drive to the track and race and then drive home. I don't think a lot of people are doing that with a three hundred dollar three hundred thousand dollar ish <laughs> car. Um, yeah. But it's but I don't think it would be super punishing on the road. I, um, I I will say that those little knobbies on the steering wheel and Mercedes has a similar version of that. I think that might be like one of my favorite design elements in any like sporty car. I just love being able to just go down one, you know, degree and ch -ch notching over. Like it feels like you're it, doing something really special, even though you're just changing the drive modes versus, you know, BMW, BMW where you're like, press the button and then you have to dig into the screen, do the whole thing. Like, I really like how this, this one looks especially. Yeah, for sure. It was really easy to use. There's so much functionality there for me. It's like, and I'm somebody too, who sort of trips over technology the first kind of like six times out and then I start to get it. Um, it, the system works really well once you understand like what you're doing and you know, what each one of the, the knobs represents. But I think Porsche has done a pretty excellent job of, of messaging that like in the display that they have too. So, um, but the cool thing, like I said, the cool thing about this is you're not just, you can't adjust drive modes, but once you're in track, I mean, you're doing stuff that on the, in, in an older race car, um, I think even the previous uh, GT3 RS, when you're changing stuff like damper settings, it's you're changing it in a way that in, in a lot of other race cars, you would have to have it in the pit or on a lift. You would have to be wrenching on something under the car on the suspension to be able to change it, where this is all active and you can do it on the fly too. Um, so I really do think it's a meaningful difference for people who are kind of driving this car, who are, who are bringing it to the track um, and driving it in the way that it was intended to be, which which is it's just great functionality. It's it's great a great user interface for that. Um, but yeah, so, so super fun car. It's, it doesn't have a ton more like the, and you guys like, you guys have been on, on the track in, in sports cars before. I think you probably understand this. I mean, the car has got 517 horsepower, which is a nominal amount. I think it might be 17 more than the GT3 or something. It's very fast. It, it, you know, the acceleration is quick, but driving it just on the racetrack, you don't get the same sense for that sort of thing, right? So you hear it once and you feel, you're like, oh, that's quick. And suddenly you're just, focused in on the task of like going around the next corner and in my case trying to chase down the porsche factory driver who's in front of you in a standard gt3 just going way way faster than you so 
Gary brought up a good question. If the, the wing can act as an active air brake and I saw it moving a little bit like in the video, right can you there, do yeah. that uh, like within the car or is it just an automatic thing on the track? Yeah, so the car, the the wing can go into full brake mode when you're when you're at speed when you're when you're hard on the brakes it goes fully flat like fully vertical, um, and acts as an air brake. Um, the wing is you can adjust it in the car, Jeff. Like, and actually, I got this a little bit wrong when we were first when I was first reading the material. You can adjust it to be anywhere. Well, sorry, you can adjust it to be st uh, static in in fully open or full, fully closed, essentially, mm -hmm. if you want for whatever reason to clean it or for cosmetic reasons or whatever uh, when you're actually driving it it is what they you know infinitely variable or nearly infinitely variable right the 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 compute various sensors and computers in the car are reading what you're doing with throttle and what you're doing with the brake um and probably some other sensor inputs as well and adjusting the wing based on what they think that you're asking for at any time right um the net effect was that it just felt like incredibly like godly basically when you're when you're in uh, we had one really long um no maybe a little bit of banking but one really long sweeping left hand turn and in that turn like as i got sort of used to the car and more comfortable with it i was just basically throttling down more and more and more and going faster and faster and in the story and in the video i say something like it, you know that um do you guys know rob holland Rob Holland is a is a test driver who's also a writer. He writes a lot for Jalopnik. Really good guy. Um, we were we were picking Rob's brain because he was on this program and he's somebody who does this for a living. Like he tests cars, he 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 tests race cars for a living and and um, tests race cars for a living. And we were sort of laughing, but he's like, it's just as simple as when you have this much arrow, the faster you go, the faster you're able to go, <laughs> right? Like the. The, the faster you drive, the more arrow you get, like when you're in a turn and the, the better you're able to hold your position on the road, which is um, kind of incredible. So um, I was I was Googling really quick. Um, man, that wing on this car is humongous. Like it is I can't I was trying to think of another car that had a wing that was nearly as big. I think the AMG GT Black Series is, is pretty big, too. But like. Is it, is it really that big in person or is it just like an optical illusion in photos? No, no, it's huge. It's a, like, I mean, they, they call out the fact that it's the, it's the first, um, at least production core show that's ever had a wing that's taller than the roof. And you can't really that's see crazy. it from every angle, but the back lip of it at, at uh, maximum height is actually higher than the roof. And, and the car itself is, um, it's not like it's super low. We're not talking about, it hasn't, I mean, it's, it's probably sitting lower on the suspension in most cases than maybe a, a standard uh, 911 Carrera. But there's for me with a helmet on, there's plenty of headroom. So it's gigantic. Um, and and it's really beautiful, honestly. It's the, the because the whole thing is carbon fiber, including the this the necks, the the supports for it too. Um, so it's it's one of those things that looks incredibly delicate. And they were sort of joking saying that two of us could easily sit on it because again it's it's capable of withstanding the force of 1800 pounds. So like two, three adults should be able to sit on it. No problem. But that's um, wild. Yeah. Yeah. It was a fun time. Did they say, um, did they happen to notice, or did you happen to know if um, they talked about maintenance on it? Cause I know um, I, I found out that the Aston Martin Valkyrie initially, like its wing was intended to be a consumable item. It was supposed to, it was going to oh, be like, wow thin and and delicate for weight savings but then would develop stress fractures over time and aston martin shut that down they like made it permanent but um with with it being as large as it is and as like apparently race ready as it is did they say if it was like consumable or needed maintenance or anything like that we didn't talk about it that's a really good question i wish that i'd ask but no they didn't that that didn't come up i mean we talked a lot about things like um, you know, this, this car you can actually still get with steel brakes. You can you can option yeah. carbon ceramic discs on it. Um, so we talked a lot, obviously, about the sort of wear and tear of of those two relative items. Um, but no, I, I we we definitely didn't talk about the wing being being replaced. I would guess because of the and again you you can see it moving, but it's got it's got two gigantic actuators in what I assume are aluminum, uh, like billet aluminum uh, coming out of it too. At the very least, you would have to pull off the carbon fiber parts and bolt them back onto the metal parts that are there, uh, or bolt the metal parts back onto them more appropriately. But uh, it, it's a great question. It's worth asking Porsche, honestly. And how much does it cost if you do have yeah, to replace yeah. it? That's, that's the critical part. Um, 
Cool, guys. Thank you. Hi again to Kevin Hawthorne. Good to see you. Uh, and EKG Canadian enthusiast who said uh, 911 GT3 is RS is a legend and still the turbo is the better option overall, especially for everyday use. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. All of us here have been in other like a, a, a standard 911, a 911 turbo, like, you know, an, uh, uh, anything kind of in between are brilliant everyday cars. It's one of the special things about that car, right, is you can drive it anywhere all the time and it feels great um this is not that i i still think that people you'll see them at like cars and coffee in la probably <laughs> but uh i it's not the best option for a daily driver uh absolutely it's just a, a really phenomenal option if you want to take it to the track so gts like every other porsche the gts is always the best for everyday driving and you can still track it and it's just excellent yeah amazing so but let's let's carry on because you guys also both had maybe uh, slightly down the scale in terms of like track readiness, but other cars that are that are pretty uh, performance oriented too, right? Uh, Brett, why don't we why don't we talk about your Audi that you were driving last week? Yeah, they they the good folks at Audi dropped off a very cool RS6 um, just in time for Los Angeles to receive its most torrential downpour that it's had <laughs> since 1987, I think. So uh, that was unfortunate timing, but it was honestly, it was great. Uh, our video producer, Kyle, and I drove it down to um, San Diego to drive the new Lexus RZ, which you'll see that review coming out on Monday. Um, but so we had, you know, we drove down and back in the same day. So we had a solid five or six hours in the car, um, you know, just kind of commuting through traffic. And it was like, it's a total pussycat. It's so easy to drive around town it's so comfortable mine had these this these same uh 22 inch wheels just these mass or 21 inch wheels i think they're just massive huge wheels for that car and um and it was so comfortable and so easy to drive just kind of around town and then um you know later in the later in the week when weather dried out a tiny little bit i took it on a, a really tight canyon road and this is a really wide car like it feels very large in the lane but you know even on this tight little twisty road you could just put all the power down all the time just because that quattro grip is insane it was it was really fun it's a great car yeah i when was the last time anybody was in an rs product like an audi rs product that wasn't that didn't at least meet your expectations or 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 exceed it like you know we had oh okay yeah. <laughs> i drove a, oh, yeah. i drove the rs5 sport back not long ago and it was like cool it was cool it was cool i shouldn't i shouldn't sell it too short it was cool it was yeah. not super thrilling and super exciting to drive in the way that like an M3 or a C63 is, but it was. I mean, well, one I, thing that's I know. I was going to say, I know you didn't yeah, love sorry. the um, the RS3 as much as Brandon and I did, Brett, when we did Star Wars. But I that no, that's so not good. true. I loved that car. That was a great <laughs> car. We were just arguing really hard about the Blackwing, and I love the Blackwing more. But I yeah. do love the RS3. It's fantastic. I drove. Um, I just had the SQ8. Uh, I don't know, two weeks ago at this point, and I haven't really driven any of the big Audi S or RS models before. Um, and that thing is so good. Like I was worried it was going to be too much, like too stiff or, or too oh. aggressive. And the RSQ8 probably is a little bit, but the SQ8 is like just perfect. I I had an SQ7 a couple of months ago as well. And um, just the, like the most brilliant balance of like, go fast performance, but also just being super comfortable on the highway. And I mean, it was nimble. It wasn't like, obviously it wasn't like a Canyon Carver, but it was fun to drive around town. It was incredible. They, they've nailed that platform, that, that kind of that lighter pressure turbo V8 is fantastic. Yeah. So one thing that I've always liked about the RS6 and, and EKG is reminding me of this too, is like, I, I mean, like the RS version of this car is amazing, but like, all of the all of the six like the the a6 the s6 like all of everything in this product line since its inception i think have been some standout vehicles in my mind because essentially we love station wagons as as car reviewers and, and enthusiasts and there aren't that many of them there aren't that many wagons available everything has been kind of lifted a little bit um cars have been morphed so that they they don't fit traditional definitions uh as well anymore and here you've got one that looks brilliant drives amazingly well is got a lot of utility i mean i guess that's that's the question there brett like has has this car lost any utility in its sort of sleekness or do you think it could, is still like a, a fabulous um one car solution for the right oh. person i guess oh yeah for sure i mean if you if you like compare it to a 
like a an e-class wagon like it's definitely smaller in the cargo area and it's not as big in the cargo area as even like the, the q8 that jeff was talking about a minute ago um it's a little bit smaller than than some of those products but it's still massive inside the rear seat is gigantic you i mean it's like mm-hmm. that like limo like leg room is such a cliche but it's so true in this car it's got tons and tons of leg room and then yeah, there's still like a solid 23 or 24 cubic feet of cargo space behind the behind the rear seats, I think. And that's just like more than more than you'll get in any sports sedan, certainly. So like you've got all the power, all the performance of like a, you know, a EKG Canadian enthusiast talking about the, the M5 and the Panamera. You got all the power of those and a ton of cargo space as well. Like it's just it it really is a, a great one car solution. My I posted a picture of it on social media. And it was like the close up of like the RS badge, and then Costco was in the background. It was just like, this is what this car was made to do, right? Like right. the station wagon. And and my brother commented and he was like, Are you seriously in my dream family car right now? I was like, Yeah. It's <laughs> that's exactly what it is. It's the perfect car for someone who like needs to live a life, but also wants to wants to drive something with five hundred and ninety horsepower. Well, and we've we've got to appreciate it while it's here too. Like uh, super producer Kyle put in the in the chat too that the we've recently found out that our 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 rumored our dreams of an RS four uh, showing up are are maybe being dashed. We have we had had a little bit of news on that front too. So um, yeah, any anytime we get anytime we have a new performance car from a brand that we love uh, these days, you know, as much as we we really like you know the the uh, EV revolution that is unfolding before our very eyes, I think. These experiences in these kind of cars always feel a little extra special because uh, we know that it's you know we're 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 reaching the end of this kind of era too. So, um, do we think EV wagons could make a comeback? Like they could bring wagons back, or is it just the wagon body style that people don't like? Why isn't there an EV wagon yet? It doesn't. It seems like it, it's probably just because it's the wrong segment. There's the there's have... the Tycon GTS. Uh, oh right, Cross Turismo or Sport Turismo. Yep. Yep. So there's, um, there's some hope. Yeah, which is it would be not, great. I would, I would like like a Polestar wagon, right? Like, oh yeah. Uh, like uh, uh, something in the like, let's keep it under. I'll, I'll be, I'll be kind and say, let's keep it under sixty thousand dollars, or maybe under seventy thousand dollars. But that that form factor with a little bit of performance, uh, and I think Polestar does that really well, where they've got that nice balance between the cars are fun to drive and, and feel sporty, even without being overwhelmingly powerful. Um, but they're, they still have reasonable range and reasonable, reasonably attainable pricing. They'd, they'd be a good fit for this with the, well, the so low Volt, Volkswagen has the space vision concept from a few mm-hmm. years ago, which is supposedly maybe coming to production. And if that's like, I don't know, 40 grand, like a, like an old golf sport wagon, that could be a hit, I think, as long as it's like not bad to drive. I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to think of like. The problem is attainability too, because how much is this RS6, Brett? This one was 141. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, well, well at the very so, least, <laughs> go ahead. I, I, I actually kind of wonder if, uh, I think it, I think there's definitely potential in like the upper echelons because um, automakers are seeing that like, like even before wagons started going by the wayside, like, a disproportionate number of the wagons on the market were the Mercedes-Benz E E class, the e, including the E63. Um, Volvo like did a pretty good job of not not even their cross country lines, but like their actual wagon lines. They did a pretty good job until recently selling those. So I think I think you really they're really going to have to target this like this upper echelon. I don't know that a forty thousand dollar station wagon is ever going to be a really great sell for most American consumers, unless it's crossoverized a little bit, like like everything else is. But yeah. But but like in terms of like low sleek long roofs, like the premium market is a perfect place for it because for whatever reason, people shopping in that echelon still like the like traditional style of wagons. So, so real quick because we need to we need to talk about Jeff. Jeff is also driving something uh, super interesting today. Um, check out the link if you guys are seeing it right now. After this is done, go back and check out the link to the story that Brett wrote last year, mid last year in the summertime, I believe, to the. Brett, you got to drive all like every generation of RX S6 yep. Avant, including the ones that were never brought to the US, right? Yep. Yeah. It was great. It yeah. was amazing. It was like a high point Truly, in my career. I will I, yeah. it might be the apex. I don't know that it'll ever, it'll ever get better than that. Truly, truly phenomenal story and a really cool event that Audi put on. Um, you guys are going to see a lot more from us and some cool stuff uh, that's coming through with Audi too in in the next in next week. Actually, you're going to see a 
very special project. So Jeffrey, yes. also the, the lowest end of the performance spectrum, but the, it's a pretty high bar in this in this particular uh, podcast this week. Tell, tell us what you're in. Yeah, well, I was going to say, we were talking about the wing on your 911. My 2023 Civic Type R also has a pretty crazy wing on the back of it. Um, yeah, so I'm driving that this week. This is my first time in the Civic Type R. Um, man, I, 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 I'm going to probably get a little bit of hate for this because like Brandon Circus, our managing editor, and a lot of other journalists that we know, it's like they get in the Civic Type R and they immediately fall in love with it. I have not had that experience yet, but I've also hmm. only been dri driving the car for about two and a half days. Um, okay. So I definitely need to spend more time with it. I'll say that like the, um, the styling is really cool. I really, really love that they made it a hatchback. I really like the wing on the back, um, the, the triple exhaust you can see right there. Like it's a really cool looking car. And uh, the interior, I, I was not expecting to like this searing red, which you're about to see in a second on this video. It is like blindingly Ooh. red, uh, but it's awesome. It's actually really, really cool. I'm just worried about getting it dirty. So yeah, so driving it, right? 310 horsepower on this one, turbo two liter, or sorry, 315 horsepower, turbo two liter, 310 pound feet of torque, zero to 60 in like 4.8 seconds. It is, um, it is a really, really quick car. Like I was surprised having driven, you know, the Elantra N and the Veloster and you, you sort of, think that it's going to be similar to that. Uh, it's a little bit quicker off the line. Um, you obviously have the six speed manual, which is really, really good, like super short throws, classic Honda gearbox. Um, and then the steering is interesting. I don't know what it is with like all of the modern Hondas. They really, really went heavy on like the heft, like artificial weightiness in like even the CRV feels weirdly too heavy for a compact crossover and like the civic si is like really heavy um this is really really heavy you really have to play with the steering like to get it to do get the car to do what you want to do um but like in the two days that i've had it i've i've gone in and i've messed with the settings a lot and the good thing is you can adjust like the hell out of this car in terms of how you want the engine to perform and the suspension and the steering all like in the individual mode um, so I think my preferred setting is like the comfort steering, like the loosest, lightest steering. And then you, you mm -hmm. turn everything up to uh, R plus mode, which is like highest, you know, engine performance, whatever, everything. It's, it's an interesting car. I definitely just need to spend more time with it. Um, and I definitely wish Florida had better roads because it's a lot of straight line driving, but I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm in like with it right now. I'm, I don't know if I can go and fully say that I love the Type R yet. Yeah, it's that's interesting. So one thing, maybe we'll have our, our first huge disagreement on the uh, Happy Hour podcast, but I think that you're straight up wrong about the heaviness of haunted steering and, and things like the CRV. I don't like, I, I don't, I totally get the pushback. I don't think it's, I mean, for that thing, it's a it's a crossover, and I need to drive this sure. one. But in cars like the SI, I've always appreciated the fact that it was it was pretty subtle, right? It doesn't. It's giving you it's giving me enough road feel to be able to do what I want to do, like in a you know a mild sports car like like an SI. Mm -hmm. um, but but still, from in my point of view, it was pretty comfortable. So maybe we have to do a back to back with this one and and um, and see about that. But. Yeah. yeah. Overall, I told I, I do understand like the, the car is like you're right when you say that everybody it, it feels like you're meant to love it. And partially you guys correct me if I'm wrong, like is it just because the last type R was such a was such a phenomenal car and such a fan favorite and such a favorite of journalists that we're we're kind of expecting brilliance from this one as well? Is it is it the the burden yeah. of expectation? I think that's probably part of it. I mean, historically all the Civic SIs and the Type Rs have been, you know, really good. So like, it's not, and it's not to say that this car is bad because it's not bad at all. It is really good. It's just like, I don't know, to me, when I jump in a in an Elantra N and I'm driving 20, 30 miles an hour around a corner, I have so much more fun in that car than I do with this one. And maybe that's just a result of like the positioning because the Civic SI is definitely a, a more daily kind of, sporty car it's not like a hardcore performance car versus this mm -hmm. which you can actually track and and have a good time with on the track and then the elantra n is like somewhere in between that and i honestly think the elantra finds the sweet spot whereas like the type r is 
you really need to live live near a twisty road that you like driving on all the time or you just want something that's way subtler like the Civic SI. And I know Brett's giving me a face right now and I'm waiting I'm, I'm to see what trying, he says. I'm trying to decide if I agree because the, I've only driven the Type R once and it was really, like it was really short. I was um, ferrying it around for Rad, during Radwood. Um, and so it was literally like a 10 minute drive in the Type R on city streets in Torrance. And I like... I, I don't know. I really liked it. I really enjoyed, um, I love the old type R. Like it's very high on my list of like, you know, in five years, I would love to own one. So I'm, I'd love yeah. to own one, but totally. um, so I'm trying to decide if I, um, if I had the same experience, I don't remember, like, I don't, I didn't, we didn't, we weren't going fast. I, I had like a lead driver who was going the speed limit and being very careful and everything like that. And so I don't remember like really being thrilled by it, but I, I do kind of seem to remember feeling that, like that sense of like, Oh, this is a car that I could just very happily own and live with, and and it would be great in so many ways. So I don't, I guess I don't remember being like thrilled and blown away by it. To your to your point, Jeff, but I do mm -hmm. remember just having this overwhelming feeling of like love at first sight, kind of a thing. So see, and and you love the the uh, Integra too, which is <coughs> you know I Civic do. Si Acura, um, and I'm like both of those cars the civic si and the integra if you go read my reviews you're going to be like what the hell is he talking about because they both scored like over nine points in my in my reviews so they're awesome cars like they're, i recognize that they are both really really good cars they just don't do it for me and even the type r is like kind of not doing it for me right now i mean but like i said i need to spend more time in this car i would love to get this car on a, on a genuinely good road or a track at some point um and i'm sure that would probably change my opinion of it a little bit but yeah, it's hard. I feel like I'm not living up to the auto journalist uh, stigma. Of, I need to love this car immediately, or or I'm fired. No, not at all. I mean, honestly, like I, Honda I just Sweet wish you would fall in line more, Jeff. Just I know, great I'm sorry. Fly right. <laughs> I think I think Honda's sweet spot should be really with the SI. I, I the the Type R, the last Type R was such a treat because it was so phenomenal to drive. Honestly, it was one of my favorite cars. It's probably my favorite car in that class since the I, my first drive in an Evo X way back a million years ago right so um that was that was really impressive to me but um but i think that like honda makes a lot of sense in as a as a you know civic si gti competitor at a price point that a lot of people can afford like delivering that warmed up um warmed up power and and just fantastic handling to the largest number of people so i have to say to you we have one more car that we want to talk about another honda but I don't know if you guys are even old enough or, or, or like saw enough of them to reference this, but that red immediately puts me in the mind of like a, like a 1981 Chevy S10 interior. That's like all mouse fur. The entire thing is mouse fur, but they did a lot of like deep burgundies and bright, bright reds. And, and the saturation of that red is just incredible there. Well, then we um, just, they need to do a, like a fully, the one thing I don't like about any type R that I've ever driven is that the front seats are red and the back seats are like black. Yep. Blacks no, I love that. I was just going to say, I love the two-tone. Like, you can get bright red up front, you get the red carpet, and then those seats in the back. That is, I do, I love the interior of this car. I I would just, I love the black, the rest of the interior being black, but I wish the seats matched. I wish you got the same, like, the same, like, Alcantara, microfiber, whatever, hmm. in bright red on the back seats, too. I, I It's more of a thing, though, now. Like, Lucid is doing that with the split no. interior treatments, and Volvo is doing those, too, right? Aren't, I, I feel like that's becoming more of a design trick. To I see feel like it's fun, you Brett. You're allowed to have fun. fun. <laughs> I, I feel like you can get away with it when you're doing very high-quality materials, but when it's, like, the standard Civic cloth, fabric like yeah, their seat true. you know like it's it's i don't know i'm cynical about it though um ekg gr corolla is more special and better than the type r oh man the the marizo edition gr corolla uh, is genuinely amazing and well, i love that car so much we're we're gonna work on this because not not all of us have been in gr corolla ekg we clearly need to even if even if it's been done before we need to put the motor one stamp on some um some real hot ass hatch and compact comparison content uh, in yeah. the near future. Hot so. ass hatch and compact. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that, that's a that's a buff book right there. I just, that's I just, a risky <laughs> Google, is what that is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not SEO approved. All right, we're gonna we're gonna talk about one more Honda, the one that just left my driveway this week, uh, and, and keep you guys a little bit long. But I just drove Honda's brand new uh, Pilot Trail Sport, which. 
actually you guys haven't brandon did the first drive on this one right so um so yeah and, and what you're seeing here i i think brandon was on a couple of weeks ago when after that first drive talking about it too um i've got it in that same sort of launch spec hero color the the super saturated uh bright blue that i love lots of people were commenting on this as i had the car um this is a great suv uh it, it is a nice Nicely compact three row SUV with a smallish third row, two seat third row um, that has, man, it, if, if Honda ever does anything right in any vehicle, it's to ignore the thing that people think that they, they need and give them the thing that they actually need. And one example of that that you're seeing right here, you missed on the video is, as opposed to having power adjustable third row seats that take forever to put up and down, Honda has just said, screw it. And they have the same, pull like really easy to drop and pull up. Oh, there's Finny, by the way, Finny, uh, my son, uh, Finn was involved in this filming because I didn't have time to take him out, frankly, uh, and do it. But, um, no, I love things like that in a car like this, where it's not like you're, it's, it's nicely trimmed. There's good infotainment system. It doesn't feel luxurious, but it doesn't feel cut right either. It feels like roughly, uh, like you're getting a good value, but where it doesn't matter, where technology doesn't matter, where I don't need to have extra like motorized third row seats because I'm not doing that all that often. Or frankly, it's just so much slower to wait for a seat to go up and down. I love the ability to just be able to pull it and it's unlocked and falls forward and then grab that tab and, and pull it again too. Um, there's a lot of that in this vehicle overall that that is just going to be standard for any pilot. The trail sport doesn't matter uh, more or less for that. Um, you know, again, like really easy ingress and egress, even though the third row is kind of small, you can get back there quite easily. I love, I do love that this, uh, the trail sport version comes with the rubber mats. I drove this car through, we've had three different kinds of weather in Michigan in this time. And it's, especially with children too, the thing would just get trashed without them. So that's an awesome addition. The fact that they go all the way through, you saw that sort of like uh, cover in the middle of the second row there too, um, is great. And then, um, you know, this is on uh, all-terrain tires. The wheels are kind of small. I think it looks a little bit weird. The profile of this car is a bit strange in the trail sport trim. But I will say this. I've been very, like, hot and cold, depending on uh, the particular vehicle, driving a off-road-focused variant of a car through the last couple months of Michigan winter, winter where we've gotten these big snows. This car was brilliant in the snow. It just... it completely uh, uh, plowed through a really deep, really heavy snow that we got that shut everything down uh, when I first got the car, about 10 inches around here. Um, did did super well, not not being fussy and being an all-wheel drive vehicle. It's, again, it's not macho. We, we were talking Bronco on the last podcast. It's nowhere near that. doesn't have the same vibes. Um, but it's a really nice, slightly more utility-focused version of a uh, a you know a crossover that people are going to use day in and day out and enjoy i think most of the time so maybe if they they delivered my civic in this color i would love it more because this blue <laughs> it's a great is color so right? good yeah it's it's a little hard to swallow on a vehicle this long and I, I can't emphasize enough i don't have a great you can see it just for a little bit but like it looks really awkward in profile to me because it's it's on smaller wheels it's on like an 18 which is not that small in theory but there's a lot of sidewall there um the upside is it even on the all-terrain tires, it rides really, really nicely. The ride quality was great, and the NVH was really good in this car, too. So um, impressed all the way around with most everything. Uh, when was the last time you guys were in something, or a pilot, or, or something that had Honda's 3.5 uh, V6 and the 10-speed automatic? Anything recently? Not for me. Not the 10-speed. I, I don't love that powertrain. I, I'm going to be honest. Like in in a world where everything is a super powerful two liter turbo, really smooth, like seamless shifts that you don't even notice. Um, this one feels kind of rough and rugged, a little a little yeah. little cr crunchy around the edges um, compared to new stuff. So there's that. Um, and I didn't do a fuel economy test, so I'm not even going to like speculate on what I was getting. But I know that as the even by the ratings, it's not it is not top of class, which um, feels like it should be for that's that's in Honda's. I hate the phrase, but like should be in Honda's DNA or, or what they do really well um, in, in, uh, in in a family vehicle for sure. Um, and then the only other like little niggly thing, and again, this might come down to was the wireless charging just didn't work very well for me at all. I would say that it worked 25% of the time that I had my phone set on that, that charging pad. So that was um, a little bit of annoyance too, although not game changing for, for a review of the vehicle, but 
There aren't a lot of good um, wireless chargers in cars in general, though. I always find it to be too, way too finicky. I feel like my like whenever I do it on a long trip, my phone overheats before my before it actually charges. I don't know if it's something weird with my phone, but I can never actually get like a, a useful ten or twenty percent increase in my battery when I use a wireless charger. That's another yeah. thing, Brett. That this is this is something that Honda has control over. Um, it uh, it pops up a warning every single time you put your phone down on the mat. It pops up a warning that's got um like basically like if you put metal in between it, it could get really hot and damage your phone which is fine but like every single time you do that it's covering like a third a bottom third of the screen um so maybe i'm maybe i'm screwing around my phone too much like that could be the answer but that got a little bit annoying over the course of the well, week too but yeah it's not even just like picking up your phone it's like going around a corner a little bit too quickly and your phone slides and then it slides back into position like it, it i i know exactly what you're talking about it happened all the time in the the, tr the passport trail sport that i drove not long ago right yeah i want to have i don't give me any warning you want automaker give me any disclaimer you want but give me the ability to, to check that i've read it and that like now we're cool legally and now and, and it can go away <laughs> i don't need to see it anymore so um but yeah, overall, I was really impressed with Pilot. I can't say, and, and I had it pulled up. I know the Trail Sport is kind of middle trim in terms of pricing to this one. Mine was over right around 50. This starts at 48 grand. The Sport is around 39 to start. Um, and that those prices all still sound high to me, but I think that is right around where you're what you're getting into with Highlander and other other uh, comparable uh Japanese they're all crossovers. all wheel drive now too that's the thing right is you can't get cheaper ones you can get cheaper cars in the class but you have to settle for front wheel drive it's it's pretty much right in line with the all-wheel drive competition which is kind of cool yep yep so good stuff honda overall um started at very high performance ended family friendly and overall uh had some some great interaction uh, i want to thank all of our our, our guests uh for chiming in here ekg I love EKG is always giving us a good summary of the segment. He's like, hey, you guys are talking about this. Here's my take on it. He said, the Pilot is an excellent SUV, but it's not as good as the Palisade Telluride, an upcoming Grand Highlander plus CX-90. Interesting points we just got. We're going to go uh, We're gonna go drive the Grand Highlander in a, in a, in the reasonably near future here. Um, so, yeah, we'd, we'd love to present a take on that, too. I don't know about Palisade Telluride. I got I to gotta think about that one, honestly. I love Palisade Telluride. Me too. Yeah, they're they're both quite good too. So, and this one was so different. This is this is obviously such a like a ruggedized version of everything that it just feels a little different too. But um, certainly a worthy thought experiment. Um, all right, everybody. Thanks again, you guys. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I know we went long. Everybody, as usual, if you have more questions for us after you're watching this this live, please leave them in the YouTube comments, and we will try and get around to answering them for you. And also, also, I think I would say this maybe yeah next week i think next week we are going to move the podcast it could be the end of march but this is going to move from fridays friday afternoons have proven uh cumbersome brandon turkis has refused to join anymore on a friday afternoon i'm making that up but um no we're going to move to thursday afternoons thursday a little bit earlier in the afternoon so we can get a bigger audience um and have more people come join us and talk to us too so look for that move um we'll message it on motor1.com and in the meantime have a wonderful weekend we'll see you soon bye hey, guys everyone.